What about sugar? So what does sugar do to, the, to our brain? What does it do to our body? Carbohydrates are glucose molecules that are strung together. Uh, the average American eats 350 to 600 grams of carbohydrates per day and 150 pounds of sugar per year. Our pre-agriculture ancestors ate less than 100 grams of carbs per day and two to four pounds of sugar per year. When we have sugar and worse yet, high fructose corn syrup, we have a rise in blood sugar, a rise in insulin, and a drop in, in blood sugar, causing irritability and further cravings for, for, for carbohydrates. When there's too much sugar, and this is especially with high fructose corn syrup, which is a sweetener added to a lot of processed foods and colas and things like that, there is excess of sugar. It goes into the liver and it produces fatty liver. This increases the risk for diabetes and liver disease. It also produces something called AGEs. This is advanced glycation end products, AGEs. In diabetes, the AGEs will bind to the to various organs like the retina causing diabetic retinopathy, to the kidney causing diabetic nephropathy, and to the nerves causing diabetic neuropathy. The AGEs have also been implicated in Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and cancers. What about omega-6 fatty acids? These are polyunsaturated, highly reactive fatty acids. And they're found in vegetable and seed oils like soybean, sunflower, corn, and cottonseed mostly what we see in processed foods. Now we need some omega-6s. A healthy ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 is a one to one, maybe four to one. But the average American has a ratio of 25 to one. So when we have a diet that is fueled by carbohydrates and sugars, this is called a glucocentric fueling. So again, we eat a carb carbohydrate, usually a simple carbohydrate or sugar, our blood sugar goes up, our insulin goes up, our blood sugar drops, we crave more, we get irritable, we crave more. This is glucocentric. If we eat a low carbohydrate diet, then the fat starts to burn. This is called adipocentric, so adipose is fat. So fat burns and it produces something called ketones in the liver. Now since the 1920s, a ketogenic diet has been used with children in children with epilepsy. Neurologists have thought for years that there's a lot of similarities between migraines and seizures. They're both episodic temporary changes in the state of the brain and its neurochemistry. They both are provoked by stress, erratic sleep, stimulants and sedatives, and they both respond to anti-seizure medications. A ketogenic diet is adipocentric means that if you eat a very low carbohydrate diet, the fat produces ketones. It's thought in children with epilepsy, these ketones penetrate the blood-brain barrier and lower, and lower, decrease the number of seizures. Some neurologists believe that using this type of diet for migraines can be helpful. For example, and your references are in there, there's um, Dr. Uh, Josh Turkneck wrote a book on Migraine Miracle, and he recommends to his patients that if you have four migraines per month, limit your carbohydrates to less than 100 grams for two weeks. Now, this isn't totally ketogenic, but it's, it's close. And then start to add a little bit so that you're up to maybe 150 grams of carbohydrates per day. If you have greater than 10 migraines per month, then go to a full ketogenic diet, less than 50 grams for about two weeks, and then gradually add in. Also, coconut milk and oil produces something called medium chain triglycerides, and these produce ketones, so it's another way to get ketones in the body. So whether you do a ketogenic diet is your choice. You can think about, you, or even just reducing your carbohydrates in your diet is probably a good thing. But these are the things that I recommend for my patients. Evaluate your carbohydrate and sugar load Definitely eliminate high fructose corn syrup from your diet. Eliminate those processed foods that have high omega-6s. And just consider maybe cutting down drastically wheat or maybe going gluten-free for a period of time. We usually recommend trial for six weeks. Add more coconut milk and oils to your diet. 
and add more omega-3s to alter that ratio of six to three by eating more uh, foods like wild-caught salmon, olive oil, supplementing with fish oil supplements, or flaxseed, ground flaxseed and chia that have DHA. What about medications? So here's a list of the rescue medications. The first three, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, the aspirin and the Tylenol, do not cause, in general, a rebound uh, phenomena with, by taking them. The others, Excedrin has caffeine in it. The triptans, like Imitrex, Maxalt, Relpax, et cetera, do cause vasoconstriction, so they can cause rebound. Ergotamines, like Cafergot, uh, DHE45, cause vasoconstriction. Butalbital is fiorinol, decongestants, all of these cause the vasoconstriction. Opioids bind to opioid receptors and can cause dependency. So all of these, if you overused, can cause that rebound and lead to chronic daily headaches. It's recommended that you don't use these rescue medications that cause the vasoconstriction more than twice a month. The first three can be used up to twice a week, unless you have reasons that you can't take non anti-inflammatories, um, such as stomach issues or kidney issues. Um, aspirin can also cause stomach irritation. Tylenol is metabolized by the liver, and some people don't metabolize Tylenol very well. So there's always exceptions. These are a list of the preventative medications. So we have our anti-seizure medications such as Topamax, Depakote, Valproic Acid, and Neurontin, beta blockers, uh, tricyclics like nortriptyline and amitriptyline, calcium channel blockers. And there's more in the pipeline. There's a uh, pharmaceutical company in Israel called Teva that's working on a monthly injectable um, <coughs> preventative that will block the, one of the pain chemicals I mentioned earlier, the calcitonin gene-related protein. And the trials, initial trials, look very promising. So here's a list of other potential triggers, but some of these are um, not only triggers, but they lower the migraine threshold. For example, I mentioned untreated Lyme disease. We have several patients that have untreated Lyme disease and have chronic daily headaches, migraines. Um, Epstein-Barr virus, mononucleosis. So these are things that should be checked. Uh, environmental exposures such as mold, lead, mercury. I mean, how many of us have lived in old houses with water damage that probably have black mold in the walls? So this is something to consider. Your environment, where you're living, how, what kind of building you're working in. And this can be checked. So the mold, uh, we have a test for mycotoxins, which is mold. Um, it's a urine test. We do this for many of our patients. And almost all of my migraine patients, I do recommend getting that tested. Um, we can also test for lead and mercury. Hypoxia sleep apnea is, um, is a cause of migraines. This is also another test we can do in our office. We um, have a home sleep study test that's very easy. You take it home and you, know, you, you don't have to spend a night in a sleep lab, which is, is nice. And I've had patients that I've diagnosed sleep apnea that have presented with migraines. Trauma such as concussions are a huge trigger or lower the migraine threshold. Physical and mental stress. And other food allergens. So we mentioned celiac, but there are other foods. Some people are allergic to dairy, corn, soy. This is also another test that can be done. We do it quite often. We have a dietitian in our office, and she likes a particular food allergy test. Also, uh, triggers can be temporomandibular joint syndrome and something called cervicogenic headache, whereas the uh, occipital nerve is pinched in the higher cervical area, and this can trigger migraines. TMJ, we've had several patients that we've sent to a group of dentists that are specialists in TMJ, and they've worked with them with splints, and that's relieved their migraines. So it depends on that per if you have that particular issue, but it's something to consider if you have jaw clicks or pain or you're grinding, um, so thinking about TMJ. 
This is an example of a mycotoxin. So this is a mold toxin test that we do in, uh, we have a, a, we collect it in our alphas and send it to a lab. This test for three mold toxins, one is called okra toxin, one is called aflatoxin, and one is called trichothecine, which is black mold. This particular 19-year-old boy presented with fatigue, uh, weight loss, and chronic daily headaches. His okra toxin, which should be under 2, was 3.76. His aflatoxin, which was, should be under 1, was 9.23. And his black mold toxin, which should be under 0.2, was 33.38. Now, interestingly, his mother um, had nothing. Why? How can that be? Well, there are some, it's, there's a genetic uh, propensity for some people that just can't metabolize or can't get rid of the toxins. So what do we do in this situation? We obviously have to clean up the environment. These are mostly airborne, but the first two, the okra toxin and aflatoxin, can also be in food. Okra toxin can be in um, coffee beans. So if anybody uses coffee beans, you either want to um, switch to something that's in a pod or eliminate it altogether or wash your coffee beans. Aflatoxin is found in, can be found in nuts. So just keep in those things in mind. This is a sample of a part of a sleep study. This particular individual had the apnea hypopnea index should be under 5, and his was 39.1. He had his oxygen uh, level, which should stay in the 90s, dropped to 72. He had uh, 183 events of hypo hypoxia or hypopnea and apnea, 62 of those were at least 10 to 20 percent below where they should be. His presenting um, symptom was migraine. These are some of the supplements that can be helpful in prevention and treatment of migraine. Magnesium, just preventatively, can be taken orally. We also do IV magnesium. I have a patient that she comes once a month. She's been doing this for years for IV magnesium, and this has kept her uh, migraines at bay. When she goes away for the summer and she can't get her IVs, her migraines kick up. Riboflavin, 400 milligrams, can, has been shown to be preventative uh, in migraines. Two herbs, butterbur and feverfew. Butterbur has better research on uh, prevention of migraines. And, um, but if you get butterbur, you want to get the PA free. There's an alkaloid in the in butterbur herb, um, so you want P PA free butterbur. CoQ10 at 300 milligrams has been helpful as well for prevention. So what if you have cleaned up your diet, you have uh, drastically reduced your rescue medications? What if you have a and maybe gone on preventatives? What if you have a migraine today? What to do. These are some of the things that have been helpful for our patients. So cranial sacral therapy, if some of you don't know what that is, um, it was founded by John Upledger, who was a doctor of osteopathy, and he was scrubbing in with, uh, our, with a neurosurgeon. What he noted that there was um, under the dura, which is the covering of the brain, he noted a pulsation, and this was the cerebrospinal fluid around the brain and the spinal column, and he named that the cranial rhythm. And as an osteopath doing manipulation, he trained himself to feel the cranial rhythm on his patient's skulls. So it's a very subtle uh, treatment, um, and there are several practitioners who do get trained for cranial sac sacral therapy, um, such as physical therapists, massage therapists, doctors, etc. So I had a patient the other day who we were able to completely uh, break her daily her chronic daily headaches with um, IV magnesium and cranial sacral therapy. Also injections. Sometimes we do steroid injections um, into the occiput, into the the around the neck area, into the shoulder, 
um, area, and this can be very helpful. Mannitol, so we do mannitol injections. It's a type of sugar, and we combine it with a little lidocaine, and we can actually, with a very small needle, inject, um, it's basically a nerve block, um, around the trigeminal area and the occiput and any tender areas on the scalp. And this has been very helpful for some of our patients to break migraines. Botox has also been helpful um, uh, in many for, for migraines prevention. Acupuncture, there's a lot of research that supports acupuncture for prevention and treatment of migraines. A massage works well for some, and some, in some it aggravates it, so it's really an individual thing. Yoga, there's a lot of yoga um, poses that can be very helpful for people with migraines. Um, and it depends on, you know, you have to kind of try them out. Forward folds, um, supportive poses like child's pose, or um, extensions that are using blocks and bolsters can, can help relieve some of the, the, the muscle tension and the nerve tension. Um, and by the way, any regular exercise is going to increase your threshold, so raise the threshold. So any regular exercise is very good for prevention of migraines. Meditation, there's just tons of research as far as the benefits of meditation for stress reduction and pain reduction. And um, I had somebody yesterday who um, said with guided imagery he was able to drastically reduce his migraines. In fact, he hadn't had one for, for quite a while, just using guided imagery whenever he felt like he was going to get one. So meditation is huge. Um, there's one thing that I don't have on here, and that's osteopathic and uh, um, chiropractic manipulation of the spine. Now, this can be helpful in some, uh, manipulating the cervical spine, um, but I just want you to be, be wary of any practitioner that wants you to get manipulation multiple times a week um, over a long period of time because this can create instability and laxity of the cervical spine. And we used to have a chiropractor that worked in our office and he actually taught um, his patients, his migraine patients, something called McKenzie technique. So you can put that on your list. I don't have it here, but McKenzie technique is a, um, a home exercise um, that, uh, that's been quite helpful for, for many uh, migrainers. Lastly, I wanted to mention something called Cephaly. It's a device that's been out for a couple years. I think it's, um, I'm not sure where it started, but I know that um, the last time I checked, you could only get it from Canada, but I think now you can get it in the United States. It's a band that um, actually blocks the trigeminal nerve impulses. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with it, so maybe some of you do. Um, I don't think it's a, you know, it's a miracle. I think it's another tool uh, for relief of, of, of migraine. So I hope I've given you tools for raising your migraine threshold and decreasing your triggers. And you may never get rid of them completely, but hopefully we can reduce the duration, frequency, and intensity and give you more pain-free and peaceful days ahead. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.